really has been a great honour and privilege to have been a UKIP MEP for the last four years. And I never forget that it was you, the members, who gave me that opportunity. A long-standing member of the UK Independence Party, Stuart Agnew was elected to the European Parliament in 2009. Born in Norfolk, he is UKIP's MEP for the East of England. With a background in farming and farm management, he sits on the committees for fisheries and agriculture and rural development. If we work hard and get things right, we could be out of the European Union by 2019. So this is where I usually meet lobbyists, uh, have meetings with different staff members. Uh, it isn't a back office, but they're all very similar, aren't they? It can, yeah, yeah, it is a bed. Um, everyone has to vacate the place by, I think, one in the morning. I think so. I've never stayed here that late, but you're not allowed to sleep here overnight for safety reasons, fire safety reasons. What annoys me about the way the committee structure is set up here is that many subjects that I think should be agricultural, such as animal welfare, are primarily dealt with with another committee. Same with environmental matters. I find that frustrating because things develop and build up ahead of steam and momentum in those other committees and we don't hear about it in the Agriculture Committee until the thing is sort of well underway, whereas you need to get in at the bottom in this establishment to register objections and complaints and get the counter-argument in right at the very beginning. Can you explain um, what it's like to attend these committee meetings? Because can you sort of go in and out of them? Yes, oh yes, yeah. yes. Um, I mean, we're going to be late for the one we're going to go to, Agriculture, but lots of people are late. I don't think there's a vote at the beginning. There is a vote, but it's fairly short. Uh, that's the voting list. Right. When, um, when, 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 when are they going to hold it? Uh, it's probably now, and you, you may miss it in order to do right. this. But frankly, um, I always try to alert you if, it's, where, an one, right. if it's an important one or where your presence or your vote might, might make a difference. Right. It's a judgment call, yeah. but my judgment is that here you won't make any difference. It's an interest in trains. There is, in no. fact, an explanation of this. Stuart is an East of England MEP, and that's a locomotive that ran in the eastern region of British Rail in the 1960s. The railway poster is, of course, for Norwich, which my, is my county town. Uh, the county town uh, for Norfolk and key to the East Anglia region. We're unusual in that we walk around a lot of these stairs, <laughs> whereas most people use the lift. <laughs> So what I like, I see a queue of people standing beside the lift and I always say, stairs are working chaps, and they look rather uncomfortable. Each of us has a pigeonhole. Yep, there's something in it. These pigeonholes, the ones here are for more general things. Uh, and we have more individual ones up near our offices uh, more for our constituent mail and that sort of thing. Do you get quite a lot? Drowned in it. Drowned in paperwork. And emails? And emails, of course. I mean, emails is just relentless. And I say things from the Canary Islands, and I say things that he doesn't like, but nevertheless he has to talk. No, I like everything that you say, so <laughs> don't worry about that. <laughs> Yeah. I don't see any point in walking around this establishment scowling and, sp and spitting and, and being unpleasant. You know, in the committee meeting I will say that he is talking nonsense, but outside the committee meeting I can have a joke with him. And that is how it should be. The, the English developed a concept of decent loyal opposition. It's, it's a, we often use the phrase, Her Majesty's loyal opposition. We believe that it is perfectly reasonable to tell someone that they're talking complete and utter rubbish, that their intellectual analysis of something um, is simply nonsense. It doesn't mean you have to dislike them or beat them up or be unpleasant. The fact that you disagree with them and think they're completely wrong doesn't mean you can't 
outside of the formal discussion and the debate, have a cordial personal relationship. In fact, I would rather be in the company of somebody who does have some views on something and does think about things, rather than some of the doors you knock on and somebody answers it with tattoos, earrings, uh, shaven-headed and couldn't care less about anything. I, I, I find that sort of person very difficult to deal with. This meeting is work extreme. Okay. We know that when we speak, we're on film. Okay? Okay. No excuse. Okay. If you pick your nose, you're asking for trouble. Stuart's presence at the agricultural committees is often quite an obvious one. Nevertheless, it is common practice to sign the registry form. Thank you, Chairman. The subject of this agenda item, simple, two words, animal health. And one would assume that a healthy animal is one that is likely to remain alive. But EU legislation, if it is in, introduced in Britain in two or three years' time, is going to kill, quite possibly, millions of chickens every year. That isn't very good for animal health or bird health. I'm referring to the imminent and postponed ban on infrared beak trimming of chickens. Now, the EU is convinced that this is horrific, brutal and barbaric act on a chicken. I would say that it's little more than the discomfort a male baby might experience being circumcised. Not much more than that. So what happens to a chicken that's had this escape from being infrared beak trimmed? Its beak has a hook on the end of it. And if it pecks another chicken in jest, it's likely to draw blood. And once it's done that, something comes over it and it has to peck again and again and again to draw more and more blood and more and more other chickens join in and you end up with cannibalism, flock cannibalism. That is what you get. Now, in the poultry industry in the UK, we are trying to prevent this madness, this well-intentioned madness from the European Union to inflict this on our flocks. Some poultry farmers have very bravely volunteered to run a flock for the 14 months that we have them on a farm without them being beak trimmed. And one of them is bitterly regretting it. Last Thursday, he threw in the towel. That's an expression we have in the UK, which means he gave up. He called in a contractor to come and beak trim his beaks that were then 28 weeks old. He was losing 500 birds a day to cannibalism. That's a horrible death a bird being pecked to pieces. We really do want to avoid it. I suggest that the EU should just back off this altogether. It's going to take many years for us to be able to breed birds that are not aggressive like this, but it's in the chicken's nature to do it. So before we bring in any more legislation, well-intentioned legislation on animal welfare that's going to kill animals, let's just look at what's being done and just put a break on it. Thank you. Stuart may be a representative for the east of England, but he has been known to venture elsewhere to help spread UKIP's message in other parts of the country. I came to Bristol where Stuart was giving a lecture about the European Union to a mixed audience of students and general members of the public at the University of the West of England. I've been talking about how this thing has been getting deeper. But there's another dimension. There's another dimension to, do this, to, to this, and that is it's getting bigger and bigger. Yet to get even bigger. We're seeing different cultures here, three, day, three different cultures. You've got the good old Nordic culture here. We don't make laws unless we feel we really need them, and then we, we do make them, we adhere to them and enforce them, etc. Then you've got the Manana culture here. Well, yes, we make a law and we only make it round to enforcing it. It doesn't matter, you know, it's all great fun. Well, we send the MEPs to Brussels, they've got to find something to do, and they are all very casual. Then you've got this here, where corruption is endemic in the, in the civil service, uh, and there's that culture. Well, they're sending MEPs, they're sending people to the, to the Commission. You're getting that culture creeping in to the way we're governing. Now, what's it like in the bear pit? What are these Union Jacks for? Anybody know? Why are the Union Jacks dotted about there? The MEPs or MEPs? British MEPs, okay. What? What the hell's that doing there? What is that doing there in the Communists? Who can that be? Anyone know? 
No mistake, I thought it was when Jeff put that, I said, get, come on, and there are no <laughs> communists in Britain. <laughs> Sinn Féin, Northern Ireland, that's who that is. Mrs. The Broom, who, uh, just to be awkward, insists on speaking Gaelic, so they have to pay an interpreter to translate the Gaelic into, into English, and then people translate the English into the other 21 languages. It means that by the time they've all finished, <laughs> <laughs> she sat down. <laughs> anyway, she insists on that. Right, the other interesting thing about this is look at the concentration over here. No other country, this is the Eurosceptic department, no other country has got that concentration of MEPs in this corner here. But we are expecting on May the 22nd to see perhaps that line go through there somewhere. They're all expecting it now. There's a rising tide of Euroscepticism across Europe and there's a brand new party formed in Germany that will probably get 8% of the vote there next time. I have the 80 MEPs, you know, there could well be seven or eight of them. Farrells will be talking to them. And all of the countries, you're going to see more of it. You can pick up a lot of votes now from first-time voters because there's a lot of young people out there who have nowhere else to stand. While UKIP's power looks set to grow in Brussels, the party will also be encouraged by the ever-increasing number of young UKIP supporters back in the UK. And it appears that none of this is lost on Stuart. It is now expected that more first-time voters will choose UKIP, a trend which makes the party's controversial ambitions ever more likely to be realised. So a couple of days in South Shields with Stuart in the last by-election, and he said to me and a couple of other guys, you, you do that side of the road, don't, I'll do this side. And we thought we'd, we'd finish the, the whole street and more before Stuart caught up with us. We turned around and then Stuart on the other side, jumping over the fence. And, 